Hello, and welcome to this two-part course on using socket programming in Python. This is a look inside how information is exchanged between programs on the internet. It will definitely help you in writing web and other internet applications. In this first part of the course, you'll learn about the basics of establishing connections between two computers. Then in part two, you'll study a simple but full application. This course begins with some background about the internet. Then you'll see code used to create connections, and finally look at code that can handle multiple connections. Sockets are the pathways programs use to send messages from one computer to another. You'll see how that's done through much of the functionality of the Socket API. And you'll see how they form a type of inter-process communication, whether it's between different processes on the same computer or over a network. This course is based on a tutorial guide by Nathan Jennings. You can find it and other materials on Sockets at realpython.com. After completing this course, you will know how to write code to create and use Sockets, create a simple client-server program, and how to expand that program to allow for multiple connections. Let me tell you about the tools I'll be using in this course. For Python program files, I use Visual Studio Code with the Dark Plus theme. My terminal shell is iTerm2 for Mac OS. And for my REPL, I use PTPython with its native theme. All of the program files you'll see are available at the link below. I'm Howard Francis, and I'm excited to lead you through this course on socket programming in Python. So let's begin. Let's begin with some background information about sockets. Sockets have a long history. They originated in the ARPANET, a precursor to the internet, back in the early 1970s, and later became part of the Berkeley software distribution in the 1980s. Even now, its Surface API continues to be updated, even though the basic lower-level API remains the same. Sockets are used to model communication based on the client-server model. It begins with a server, which controls some type of resource. The server continually waits for some other process to request access to this resource. The client represents a computer or process which wants access to that resource. It creates a connection to the server, makes its request, then waits for the server to provide it. In the next lesson, you'll see the part of the Socket API that carries out these actions. In this lesson, you'll see the part of the Socket API you'll be using most in this course, plus a brief description of other parts of the Socket API. Here are the basic tools of the Socket API. Socket, Bind, Listen, Accept, Connect, ConnectX, Send, Receive, and Close. Throughout this course, you'll see how those are used to manage connections. This basic functionality is mapped to their counterpart system calls. But you should also be aware that there's much more to the Socket library than you'll see in this course, including functionality specific for servers and many specific to different protocols, such as hypertext transfer protocol and simple mail transfer protocol. But this course looks at the more basic functionality. And in the next lesson, you'll learn how this part of the API creates and uses sockets for transferring data. In this lesson, you'll see how sockets set up and maintain connections between the server and client programs. There are two internet protocols sockets can use when sending data. The first is Transmission Control Protocol, TCP. Its important properties include that it's reliable meaning packets lost during transmission can be detected by the sender and resent. And the data is read by the receiver in the order it was sent, called in-order data delivery. The other protocol is user datagram protocol. It uses less overhead, since it doesn't track for lost packets or similar issues. So it's primarily used where speed of transmission is more important than reliability. Of these, TCP is the default protocol sockets use, and it's the most frequently one used, mainly because it does try to react to lost packets. 
Here's a diagram showing the activities in the server and client processes and the timing of each relative to the other as data is sent and received. The server begins by creating a socket, binding it to a port, listening for client requests, and finally accepting one when one comes in. That request happens when the client process creates a socket and requests a connection to the server. Then the client sends data indicating what it's wanting from the server, which the server then receives. The server then processes that incoming data with the request, performs the actions needed to return the data desired, then sends that to the client process, which then receives the data and uses it however it was intended. Then the client indicates it's closing the connection, which the server receives, and then closes its side of the connection. This can be broken down into four phases. First, the server creates its listening socket. It does this with the creation of a socket, then using the bind, listen, and then run requested accept method calls. For its part, the client creates its own socket, then calls the connect method to initiate a connection with the server. Then the two processes alternate sending and receiving data. And finally, the connection is closed. In the next few lessons, you'll see how each of those method calls are used in the creation of a simple echo server. In the next few lessons, you'll learn how to use the basic socket API to create a simple connection between two processes. This first example will be an echo server and a client to use it meaning that the server is just going to echo back to the client any messages it receives. We'll start with the server side of the process. So remember, the first phase of the process is to create a socket and have it listen for a request to connect. Let's go ahead and write this part of the server program. First, you want to import the socket module, which is part of Python's standard library. You don't need to do a pip install or anything to get it. Phase one of the process is to set up the listening socket. Values for the host and port number are being hard-coded as constants for this example for simplicity's sake. Future examples will obtain these values in a more realistic way. This number represents the local host, a reference to the computer this is running on. This server will only accept connections from this computer. If you use an empty string for host, the server will accept a connection from any computer. This indicates what port to listen to. You can select any number larger than 1023. If you're sharing a system with other users, you might want to check with your system administrator what numbers you're allowed to use. Socket is a resource Python can manage, so you can use a with statement to open it, and you don't need to use a close statement. This creates the listening socket. The constants to the initializer indicate that the program is going to use version 4 internet addresses and TCP socket streams. As you can probably guess, this binds the socket you just created to the host and port you want to listen to. This too does exactly what it says. It's going to listen for a request to the server from this socket. When the program gets to this line, it will pause waiting to accept a connection. This is called blocking. No other processing on this program will take place until a connection is accepted. When a connection is accepted, the client and server negotiate a new port to use for their interaction. It returns a socket address pair, where the new socket, here called con, will interact with the address returned, named ADDR, which includes the port the socket will use. Here again are the details of each step as the program was being written. Create the socket with a resource manager, binding the socket to the desired host and port, waiting for a connection, then accepting the connection and creating a new socket to handle the communication with the client at its address. Phase two of the process is performed by the client, and you'll see in the next lesson how that works. But once the connection is established, we're up to phase three, exchanging data. From this server's perspective, 
All it needs to do is read the data it receives, then send it back. Let's go ahead and add this to our program. Open the new socket using resource management. So again, you won't need an explicit close statement. There'll be a simple diagnostic message sent to the server's console to see where this connection is coming from. This next activity will take place as long as the client is sending data. The server will read up to one kilobyte of data from the client. If the client didn't send any data in that packet, then the server will end execution of the loop by breaking out of it. Otherwise, it will send all that data it received back to the client. And again, this loops until the client closes the connection. So you open the new socket, and then in a loop, receive data from the socket, which the client will have sent, and then send all of that data back. This part of the program will repeat until the client sends an empty packet indicating that it's closing the connection. That completes the server part of the process. In the next lesson, you'll see the client side of this process. In this lesson, you'll learn about the client that will connect with the Echo server example. The client begins with phase two of the process where it creates a socket to connect with the server. And those instructions are much simpler than the servers. Let's write this program. Again, you want to import the socket module, hard coding the values for the server this client will connect to, creating the socket using the same constants for the initializer, version 4 address, and TCP sockets. and then finally a call to connect to the desired host and port. Once again, the program will pause here until the connection is accepted and established. Again, creating a socket in the same way as the server socket, then making a connection using the server's host and port values. Once the connection is established, it's time to exchange data. Let's add this to the client program. The client starts the process by sending data to the server. This data usually includes information about what resource of the server it would like. But in this example, the request is simply data that will be echoed back identically. Here, the familiar message, hello world. The B preceding the string means that this data will be sent in 8-bit units. The client then waits to receive whatever data the sender will send back, and that will be stored in the variable data. There's no more use for the server, so in the code, you end this with block, automatically closing the socket. Finally, the client will display on its console the message that was echoed back. First, the client sends the data to the server, then attempts to receive the server's data back. Then, having no other use for the server, this block of code ends and the connection is closed. And the client then displays the data it received. In the next lesson, you'll see these programs in action. Let's now run our server and client and see them working. Remember, you have to start the server first. So in a terminal shell, you'd launch the server. You won't see any output yet because the program is waiting to accept a connection. You'll need a different terminal shell on the same computer to run the client while the server still runs. When you launch that, the echoed message will be displayed right away. But when you look back at the server's console, you should see where it displayed the connection made to it. Let's do that. I have two different terminal shells running in iTerm2. On the top one, I'll launch the server. Notice that the program is still running. I don't have the system prompt. The socket has been created and the server is listening for a connection to accept. Now, go down to the bottom shell and launch the client.
That didn't take long. You can see the output with the message echoed back from the server. And if you look at the top half of the screen, you'll see that the terminal has displayed the connection information. Notice the port number, 53985, is the one established by the socket accept function. Each time a client accesses the server, a different port will be used. So expect to see different numbers when you run the program. In the next lesson, you'll look at tools to help you diagnose when things might not quite be working right.